We're right on time now, and I'd like to introduce the next speaker. It's uh, Admiral Richard West. He's a retired U.S. Uh, Navy and former oceanographer and navigator of the Navy, in fact. He's going to speak to us about the National Academy's Polar Icebreaker Cost Assessment Study. Dick? Doesn't work? Then what? Why are you giving it to me? <laughs> this one here is the forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I have to say I was real honored to uh, to chair this committee. Uh, I also had a few of my pals say, "How the hell did you qualify to be chair of this distinguished group?" And there's really two reasons why I, well, I'm qualified. One is uh, Secretary of State Seward in my hometown are the same in upstate New York. One qualification. The second one is I'm a member, a loyal member of the Royal Realm of the Blue Nose. That's enough, correct? Uh, last fall, like, Congress asked the Academy to take a look at the, uh, the nation's requirement for icebreakers. The task list was very long. In fact, it was two pages long. And it's in the report, uh, and I won't go through all that. But what it boiled down to is to focus on, it's a cost-based study, and focus on uh, the acquisition strategy for the acquisition and operation of, co of icebreakers for the United States. Uh, our report's available. Here's the website, and nobody's to go to it to find a question for me. There's, there's 147 pages in this document. Our report's only 20 pages, but we validate everything we say in there with the rest of the, the document. Uh, this is the uh, very distinguished group, and, and Mark Hutchings, who is our study coordinator from the Academy, is here. And I have to give him a lot of credit for getting us through. This was a six-month study. Uh, it was a very difficult study to do within six months, and thanks to Mark for, for guiding us through. He didn't know at the end that the review process over the last four or five weeks has been <laughs> very extensive. But this is a very good crowd. We lost one gentleman last month. Dave Pekoski, who was nominated to head up TSA, so he left a very distinguished crowd to go to a much more distinguished crowd, we think, and we wish him well. Uh, the way we approached our, our study because of the confined time was the first two meetings were going to be gathering data. The first being, who has an interest in the polar regions? Tell us what, you, what, you, uh, what your interest is. And then the second meeting was going to be with shipbuilders and, and folks that are familiar with building ships. Uh, for some of you, I know Ruth was there, uh, Martin Jeffries was part of it. We gathered the data on the federal agencies and what their interests were in the polar regions. In our second uh, meeting, we uh, met with the shipbuilders, uh, architects, uh, the folks that built the Sukuliak, et cetera, so to gain interest. But you, can see, but you can see from our committee makeup, we had a lot of expertise, a lot of years of building ships on our experience. Uh, on the third meeting, we actually went out to Seattle because all the ships were there. This is your fleet. Somebody said yesterday, this is not a fleet. It is your fleet. This is your post play. And there's three ships there. Two of them work. One of them doesn't. One of them is a parts bin uh, for the other one. Uh, the Polar Star had just gotten back from the Antarctic, uh, so we had a chance to talk with the crew, have lunch, talk to the skipper, which to me, having driven ships all my life, was fascinating to talk with a skipper who's done this all his career bumping into things where I was always trying to avoid them. Uh, so if you ever have a chance to have a beer and talk with him, it, it was a great experience. But anyways, every time it comes back, it has to go into dry dock. It's that old. It's 40 years old. Uh, it's got CP, uh, uh, control pitch propellers, which are uh, problematic for that ship. So every year it has to go back to get fixed up so it can go back to the following year. So it's not going to last much longer. The Healy is a great ship in good shape. It's only 17 years old probably through about half of its life, but it's not a big one. So you have basically one and a half ships as your polar icebreaker. As a huge maritime nation, you've heard this, I'm not going to repeat it all, you've heard it the last day and a half. How the hell did we ever get ourselves in this position with all the opening up and the access to the polar regions? So hopefully uh, this will be the final report that the, the folks to be will have need to get on with building icebreakers. Uh, I bring this up. One, one of our recommendations is when you bring the Polar Star back, because we're going to need, you have a gap. Even if you start building icebreakers tomorrow, it's four to five years before you get your first one. So this is what we've got uh, for the next four to five years. And there's not much out on the market. 
Uh, we've had some problems trying to get international support for the Antarctic in the past. We were told to look at what's available out there to buy, lease, sell. There's none. So this is it. So one of our recommendations is an enhanced maintenance program for the Polar Star when she comes back, in addition to the corrective maintenance that she gets every year to go back, do a little preventive maintenance to keep her going for five to seven years. Uh, our major recommendation is buy four. Buy four heavies, common design, for lots of reasons. And if you go into our report, there's a, it's in excruciating detail why, why that, we think that's, uh, that's the way to go. There was two reasons for four. One is the acquisition strategy. One was the operational concept for our polar icebreakers. The uh, Coast Guard is on record with three heavies and three mediums based on a high latitude study. We, uh, we, with all of our homework, we do think that this is the minimum amount that you do need for the operational requirement is for of the common design. Obviously, common design reduces your maintenance, operation costs, crewing, et cetera, et cetera, sort of the Southwest 737 uh, concept. So, uh, and we've also found during the costing process, which you'll see in our document was pretty exhaustive, that the fourth big one would actually be cheaper than the first if you started a whole new design for a medium class. Now, there is a place out there where the curves cross that if you want to build six or more or something like that, and they want to be a different class, they may at some point be equal. But initially, the first design of a new class would be much more expensive than a fourth or fifth ship of the large one. Uh, a four was based on a continual presence in the Arctic, and I think after a day and a half, you'll know why. We want one up there. It's, uh, if, you got a, if you want a 1-0 presence, you need three ships. That's, the Navy knows that. The Coast Guard knows that. So you need to rotate. So there's three, and you need one from the Antarctic. That's four. So we think that's the bare minimum that you need for the mission. Another thing we were told to look at is who should operate them. We looked at a lot of our models, uh, lease, buy, MSC model, all sorts of things. And the lease versus buy was done exhaustively, and you can look in our report on that. It's much cheaper for the, uh, for the government to own it by 19% by our calculations. So that was up front. There's new uh, regulations by OMB that if you do lease, you have to put money up front for them. And there's lots of reasons why buying was the best way to go. We looked at manning, et cetera. We want the Coast Guard mission. We want nine of the 11 Coast Guard missions can be done by a polar icebreaker. We want that white ship with a red stripe up there in the Arctic. So that was, that was another discussion we had. Uh, the block by strategy, uh, unless you're in the acquisition management, it's, it's rare to do, but it's, this is the perfect operation to do it when they're all the same kind, they all do the same mission, there's a lot of technology and design out there available to do them, and this is the most cost-effective way to build these four ships. And we detail in great uh, detail in the report how to do this. Uh, You've got to use the international technology. We have not built an icebreaker in 40 years but there are lots of them being built around the nation. Scandinavian countries have design. You can go get that design to help you. So we highly recommend that they do that. Com commercial off the shelf, international standards, ABS, polar code, et cetera. And we uh, recommend minim minimizing the mill spec uh, requirements for their, for their vessels. This was a more emotional issue. Uh, it's the science capability, but it was one of the tasks we were asked to look at. Should the new polar icebreakers have a science uh, research capability? And the answer that we came up with, if you're going to send a ship that goes to a place where no place out, no other ship can go, to a place where we don't know a hell of a lot about it, you ought to have some science capability while you're there. Uh, and so we came up with a concept that you should be able to make a science-ready ship if you design in space and wait for that future capability in the original design. And so our guys went off and costed that. We were, we were surprised that you could put the original design for a, what we call a science-ready vessel for about 10 to 20 million in addition. And this is in addition to roughly $900 million for an icebreaker. So that's what we recommend. And if you want to outfit it, and we did a lot of homework with the folks that did the Sekuliak and everybody else that outfits oceanographic ships, at one point, if you have this in the original design, you can go ahead and put your oceanographic over the side handling, your conics boxes, whatever, uh, for about 10 to 20 more. That would be on top of it, but it's a significant reduction in cost rather than going back and retrofitting a ship later on. Uh, 
There's a, the, the, the other compromise, of course, is if you want to go to sea for science, you don't design an icebreaker, and vice versa. If you want to go do research, you don't design an icebreaker. So there's got to be some compromise, and that's something that's going to have to be dealt with. Did I do my 10 minutes? Where's Pablo? I want to make sure I got my gift. OK. Uh, the, the other thing that there's some, there's a, you know, a lot, a lot more than, to this than, than I had to go over. But these are the main points. And I, I encourage you, if you're interested in details, to go to our report. But the whole thing about infrastructure struck me. It's hard to put infrastructure up there, as we've heard. A large icebreaker there all the time is a lot of infrastructure with a lot of help that's there immediately. And once in a while, we'll get a question about, why, why the hell are you building the icebreakers? The ice is going away. You know, that's for the, it's not this group, I guarantee you. But the answer to that is, that with everything that's going on up there, if you can guarantee me exactly when you'll need the capabilities of a heavy icebreaker with a painted white with a red stripe on it, then fine, maybe we can just go with one or two in certain times of year. But we can't do that. And with the Navy and all sorts of other, you can come up with scenarios where I may need that person, that ship there, right now and we don't have that capability so happy to answer questions well good news is we have some time bad news uh, we have a lot of questions so see how you can I, I handle don't. them <laughs> i'm going to start with one that it's one of my favorites so probably anonymous is me but i didn't even know i was asking this question why, why doesn't the u.s give serious consideration to the constructing of i guess nuclear powered icebreakers <laughs> Cost, for one, uh, mostly that. We, uh, yeah, cost. OK, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> hey, does anybody want to argue with that? No. OK. All right. Is there any way to show the Navy stop? Well, I yeah. guess it was there. We That's used to have surface nukes. And they became you know, our carriers and obviously submariners. But uh, surface ships are no longer. There may be a fire sale in Russia. So. Is there any way to shorten the time from commission to use? Uh, no. Uh, that's all laid out in the report, too. And, and we're, I mean, we're talking about, I learned a lot about shipbuilding, by the way, with some real experts on our committee. And it's four years to build a ship. So even in the, right now, the Coast Guard has got a proposal, I think, for five. We got Coast Guard in here? I think you've got, you're funding five contractors to come in with initial design and estimated costs. I think it's due next month. They're going to down-select from that to a design. So you won't get a design out there for a proposal to probably 19, probably early 19 or so. And so by the time they get back, and you add four years conservatively to that, we're talking about 23 or 24 before you have your first ship. And so we've got a huge gap problem here. And so one of the things we were asked to look at is what's, what's, what happens if we have a problem in that? It's hard. It's going to be hard. There's not much out there. Uh, the Australians are building one that's going to be in commission here pretty soon, another year or so. And they're friendly, I think, still. I, you know, I never know lately. Uh, the Canadians are building a different backer, but that's, that's three or four or five years out, too, I think. So the, the, uh, the resources for icebreakers are, are pretty thin. I'm going to continue with the online questions because they're quite interesting. And I believe a lot of coasties are out there furiously uh, typing them. Uh, having four new icebreakers is one thing, but what needs to be done? But what needs to be done to properly staff and operate these vessels? I'm concerned about human capacity. Uh, I, I guess I understand the question. One of the, one of the challenges when we talk to the crew out there, you know, if, if there's only one ship, you kind of don't have a lot of diversity of a crew, and there's not much of a career pattern and rotation and all that stuff, which is, which is really hard, by the way. There's some frustration there. And we think with building a fleet, I think four, four bigs are a fleet, that you can have some career rotation, some, some, you know, some promotions for career and, and expertise. Uh, I'm not sure the skipper of the uh, Polar Star was telling us how he gained his expertise. He actually went to, I forget where it was, Mark, do you remember? Went off to Finland or someplace and, and operated with an icebreaker there for a while, then was up on the Mackinac and in the, uh, in the Great Lakes. And then, but there's no pipeline for this whole career pattern. And we think that's another missing piece here that can be, can be well served with a fleet of four large icebreakers. 
And a follow-up to that question, where would these, particularly the three Arctic icebreakers, be stationed? In the Arctic itself? <laughs> We, we had some long discussions. That I'm not going to get cross-fedded with the commandant where he puts his ships because I understand it was a little bit of an issue about where they were uh, on the West Coast. But no, we, in our report we talk about you can do uh, uh, dual crew manning. Uh, we've always tried that. The Navy still does it with some ships. There's some, some, some problems with that. You can home port the one down south. There's some real logistics and people problems with putting one down say Australia or someplace like that, but there are, there are options of, of, of doing that, uh, but that's clearly up to the operational concept of how, how the Admiral would like to deploy his ships. Yeah, and back to human cap capacity, why not establish and support a civilian cadre of ICE pilots to serve on U.S. Coast Guard icebreakers? They will have a lot of knowledge and experience as specialists. I, I would say the skipper of the Polar Sun, I wish I could remember his name because I really enjoyed chatting with him. He's a nice pilot. <laughs> because he, he's done it all his life, but there's not very many of them and, and, as far as the Coast Guard. And here again, back to the career pattern, where you have a J.O. I think one of the, the junior of the, the OODs on the uh, Polar Star, I think only one of them had ever punched ice before. And so that, that whole cadre, cadre comes back, and what happens to him for a year, and then, you know, so there's really no career pattern. The Coast Guard should develop their own. And, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but... I think so. One more online, and if there's another one uh, here in the audience, we'll, we, we still could take it. I really like this one. That did the National Academies consider a dedicated science or hydrographic capable icebreaker that could be added to the NOAA fleet to advance NOAA's hydrographic and science mission in the Arctic? Uh, we kind of did. We, of, the, of the four ships, we recommend that you, because of, of the timing, that four ship would probably should be outfitted with the extra $20 million worth of gear because that's when the Healy's going to come offline. And so that, uh, as far as going into NOAA, NOAA does not have any hard, ice-hardened ships, as I know. Uh, by the way, there's a hell of a difference between ice-hardened and ice-breakers. Uh, you know, you're gonna, and you know, we found out there's things called ice-pushers, too, that just kind of push things out of the way. You know, ice-breakers actually ride up and smoosh down on them. I didn't know that when I started this, so. Uh, but no, uh, I, I doubt very much if Noah, Noah's reinvesting and recapitalizing his fleet. I had a chance to co-chair with Bob Winokur here, the recapitalization of the Noah fleet here this last year. Uh, so no, there's none in, in Noah that I know of. Uh, I mean, the Skuliak, as you heard from Brian, yeah, is, is an ice, ca ice capable, uh, yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're capable, so if they bump into something when they're in the, in the region of ice, it's not going to punch uh, As long as we can use the Coast Guard icebreakers, that'll be sure. fine. So. Well, there is a, there is a, a and I, I'll bring up a, a sore issue with me personally as I went through this whole thing. There is a, there is a, a, a uh, I want to go research on that ship. No, I want to go with a Coast Guard <laughs> mission on the ship. And there's this sometimes a little bit of tension that you're trying to do both. I think you can get over that. I think you should. I think it's a people thing that can be solved. Uh, you know, like I said, an icebreaker is not an ideal research ship. If you want an ideal research ship, we have those. It's Kuliak, other CRVs, et cetera. So. All right. Uh, I think we, we do have a question yeah. here. I may not have much time. Let's well, see me, how one, other, one other quick uh, one. Other, we briefed the uh, Coast Guard last week. We briefed both the House and the Senate uh, authorizers last week. And uh, we're testifying uh, uh, in front of the... Uh, House Committee, Transportation Committee, next Tuesday. Our, the, the Coast Guard has advertised that their, their icebreaker would be around $900 million over the last two or three years. Our detailed cost estimate comes up, it's pretty close, about 983 for the first one. And as your learning curve goes down, the last one's about 671. So the average for about all four would be about 760, somewhere in that area. Uh, the, we have about three questions in okay. one minute, so three. I'm sorry. Uh, Hi. Yes, no, yes. <laughs> Denise Michaels, Nome, Alaska. I have a great place to park one of those um, once my deep draft port is uh, built. Question, in regards to self-rescue, um, what was the thought on just one for Antarctica? And then also looking out in the future at Alaska, too, may want to have ice-breaking service just like the Great Lakes do. We are part of the U.S., as a lot of folks don't remember. So. Well, Thank you, but no more compound questions. Well, I think 
the answer to both those questions is the same. It's an icebreaker presence there all the time. That's your SAR, that's your ice breaking capability, that's your emergency, anything, that's your law enforcement, uh, et cetera. So that's why, another reason why we, we, we think it should be a Coast Guard icebreaker. Okay. Admiral, uh, excellent yeah. question for you. It was the idea to um, build these vessels in one yard or um, to spread the industrial cast capacity to two yards? Uh, it'll be a competitive bid uh, handled by the Coast Guard. Like I said, they, they're going to get five estimates, I think, next month. They'll, down, you know, they'll use the best of those to come up with a proposed you know, an RFP with that design. Anybody can compete. As you know, not every shipyard is going to be able to build. These are big, big ships with a lot of unique technologies. Uh, and the Coast Guard will pick you know, what, what yard it'll go to. Very quickly, Brad. Very quickly. Mike, yes, um, microphone. The microphone. Let's say you build four and there are four signs capable. Have you had the conversation with NSF to support that science operation? No, that's not, that's not our call. Okay. We, you know, we, we, we stayed away from individual agencies' uh, budgets. We, we're talking on behalf of an investment of public money into what we think is important for the nation. I don't care where the money comes from. If it's important, somebody will come up with it. Uh, so, no, I, there was some issues about, you know, I, I don't want science capability, so I don't have to pay for it. Fine. We, we think there ought to be a science capability on a Thank you speaker. very much. Thank you. Did I qualify for my...